Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to this presentation. I want to open in by thanking my friend Isidro Salcedo who helped me to put together all these best practices. Um, so a little bit about myself, like I'm a principal engineer at at and I have 21 years of experience coding in different programming languages and platforms. I started with Pascal coding just for DOS and right now I'm just developing like all kinds of microservices in the enterprise framework. Uh, today I'm learning Rust and Go, that's kind of my next goal for the next year. And I'm a big fan of football and Formula One. So I'm pretty sure that you already heard about at and and specifically DirecTV, that is the unit that I work for. We're uh, delivering products for all these platforms that we see on the screen. We have access to mobile devices, any iOS, Android devices, phones and tablets. Uh, we have access to Apple TV, satellite, Roku, Chromecast and smart TVs. We are in, in the web browser and we're even in some airlines. Like whenever you fly with some of uh, our partners, you can see DirecTV or the DirecTV brand. The three brands that we have at the bottom of the screen, those are the three main products that we have. We have the DirecTV brand, which is probably the most famous, is the one that you have a satellite dish for, the one that everyone has in their house. And this year we just released Watch TV and DirecTV Now, which are streaming services. They are both the streaming services. And that means that you can have access to all of our programming guide without having to uh, need some satellite dish or any setup. Like you, you can just hire the streaming services and that's it. Our platform, today we are running hundreds of services running in Kubernetes. In Kubernetes. We have a mixed environment of Java, Node.js, TypeScript, BrightScript, Scala, Kotlin, Groovy, Swift, Objective-C, I think you got the idea. All of our microservices talk through several protocols, mostly via REST, Kafka, MQTT, and NATS. NATS is personally one of my favorites. And I want to start talking about like, how can you size the, the needs of a company? And the first question that comes to my mind is to define what is a second for the company? What does it mean to be operating in a second? For us, every time that you turn your TV on, every second of video that we deliver to your TV means that we're trying to work with different formats, which means that we have content in HD, SD, 4K, and we deliver it through the same pipe at the same moment, all synchronized. We have different transport. As I said before, we have satellite and broadband. Uh, we have to handle multiple DRMs because as you know, we don't own the content that we have on the network. Like it comes from multiple providers like HBO, ABC, whatever. Each one of them has its own DRM and we have to honor that. We have different business rules and features, each one per network, channel, device, and content. So that means that one of the channels can say like, you can only have this many number of concurrent streams or you can only have access to the HD stream or whatever. And we have to decide that in real time. Um, some other providers of video on, uh, on over broadband, they, I'm not gonna say that it's simpler, like they have different needs, but the point is like they don't have to do this validation in real time and it's something that makes a difference from other providers. Behind the scenes we have, um, in our newest product, which is the DirecTV Now, we have buckets that have 600,000 operations per second and I'm talking about the product that we just released a few months ago. We have tons of gigabytes processed like Everything that is metrics, video files, metadata, and everything goes ingested all within one second. We have about three gigabytes of metrics that we capture every second. We have 300 channels plus in DirecTV now. It's all encoded on real time. And we have like many pipelines, CICD pipelines happening per second. So I'm not saying that we have six projects right now. I'm saying like every moment that you take a look at our CICD pipeline, there is at least six projects that are being built at that moment and released to production. We have hundreds of lines of new code every second and we have 600,000 authentications per second that they all go to a Couchbase server indirectly or directly. Before we get to the part where I start talking about a little bit more about Node, just a little bit, a little disclaimer. Like I know that there is always some runtime that is faster than Node. I know that we have Go, we have Rust, we have C, and we have Assembly. Like uh, that's something that is given. I'm going to explain the reasons why we have a heavy investment in the Node.js ecosystem. And again, I wouldn't be surprised if next year I want to talk about Rust, how we move to Rust some of the stuff. So the question is then, why did we choose Node for several of our services? Well. Node is really fast at I.O. It has a really fast boot time, which is something that when you're running a complex uh, microservices environment is something that you really appreciate. Um, as you may imagine, because of the business that we're running, we have a lot of seasonal traffic and we have a lot of spikes all of a sudden, like when you start your TV 
um, is something that is going to happen, for example, um, tomorrow, Thursday, when we have NFL, like all of a sudden our traffic goes up like crazy. So you really want to scale up or be able to scale up within a second, go from whatever the size your infrastructure is, that times two or times three, whatever is required. Um, it has a great potential at optimizing itself. Like many people don't know, but Node.js, when you write a service, the first time that it runs, it compiles to machine code and it optimizes as it runs. Like every time that you run the, for the first minutes or so, the Node compiler keeps optimizing your code so your application gets just faster over time. And that's something that we really like. It has integration with C++ and Rust, which is also something that you can use if you want to get the last drop of performance and you want to get something even faster. That's always an option. It has great tooling, like um, just recently there were like some tools that were added to measure performance with CPU profiling and memory profiling, and those are really nice. My favorite feature about Node is that it's really productive language for developers. Like you can get anything done in just a matter of minutes. Like you don't have to wait for compilers or any other sort of things happening in the background. And JavaScript, like it or not, is part of the lingua franca of the modern world. You see it on the desktop, you see it running bots, you see it running browsers, serverless, backend, IoT, recently even machine learning. And today we saw like event sourcing is one of the, the languages that you can write with JavaScript. So a developer has to focus in just a single stack to get any of these tasks done. So now that we define that Node.js is a great option for us, like we can say confidently that Node.js is part of our favorite duos at DirecTV. I have my per personal preference for all these duos and my favorite is Couchbase with Node.js. That's the one tool that I, is part of my performance toolkit. So how do we use Couchbase in AT&T DirecTV? We have 2 million, 200 million documents today. Again, I'm just talking about the streaming portion of the new product. Um, across multiple clusters, 33 of these, 33 million of these documents live in a single bucket. We have a mixed usage of cache only solutions and cache plus SQL. I think I'm gonna focus a little bit more on cache. Cache is my favorite feature in, in Couchbase. And we have three main platforms already using Couchbase, Java, Go, and Node.js. Uh, one of our buckets, as I said before, has like 400,000, 600,000 operations per second. And we have up to 6,000 queries per second in a single server using Nickel. But the story really is not about like what we just do every day. It's like even what do we do to avoid these kind of problems? Like this is something that happened to us in production one day. One day. Actually it was pre-production is when we released the first beta of our product, directly now. One day I just realized that our query servers were running at 100% for a long period of time. Um, and it was really a really low number of queries per second. We were just running 600, 800 queries per second and we were seeing a response time of three seconds and we were seeing like this behavior in our cluster. So we were trying to figure out what was happening. And of course we have all these kind of tools that we can use to help us to detect what is the problem, but we opted for doing something more methodic. So here's the first advice of stuff that you have to do when you work with Node.js and Couchbase specifically. Um, when you set a connection to Couchbase, make sure that you list in their connection string uh, at least two or three of the nodes that are part of the cluster because if one of them goes down and you try to reconnect, you're not gonna find that endpoint. So there is a lot of potential failure in that case. And that's why you have to define at least my personal preference is to define all of the data nodes as part of the connection string. You can see a very simple snippet here with the first line where you can see that we're listing um, three of the clusters. And if it's not visible, I'm pretty sure that the slides are gonna be available later. It's gonna wanna go over. Advice number two, keep control of the resources available to your service. And don't make your service available to, to the overall network until your connections and every resource that you need for your service is already up and running. In Node.js there is a very simple a uh, tool that we use that is called the event handlers. Uh, Node.js provides a really nice library to do that natively. You don't need to install anything else. And again, this is a snippet where basically we set event handlers for our help endpoint in our REST application so that every time that someone hits our REST endpoint, in this case Kubernetes, is gonna check if the service is available to take traffic or not. And um, by simply adding these switches, control switches, to let the system report its own help, you're pretty much preventing from users to come to an unhealthy service and taking some unvalid response. So make sure that you do this. It's part of the Kubernetes guidelines anyway. 
advice number three, avoid using big or large number of documents, um, sorry, large size documents, uh, because this can affect really bad, not only your application, it's gonna affect your network, it's gonna have effects on serializing your, your queries, like if you have a query that is retrieving documents of one megabyte, you might be blaming the wrong tool for your slowness, when really uh, part of the performance impact that you're gonna have is gonna be on serialization, compression, and other things. So it's really important to keep an eye on that. Advice number four for applications with a huge writing rate. Uh, sometimes, like in, in our case in particular, when you have an application that is producing a cache or creating a cache out of a third party uh, source, like if you're gonna fetch some metadata from a third party service that you end up caching in a couch based environment, very often when you have high throughput, like you're gonna end up with two processes trying to write the same document at the same time or multiple documents at the same time. And that has multiple side effects. Like on the one hand, like you are already overusing your network, like you to write exactly the same document, even though you can try to do an offset and, and handle the, the cast number to see that there is no collision or whatever. The best advice that I can give you is like try to avoid as much as possible simple, simply to sending those requests. In Node.js, you can keep a queue of the, the number of items that you are populating at any given time. And in that case, you can make sure that if there is a second writer that is trying to produce the same document, it's gonna be terminated immediately and that has a serious performance impact. In our case, we did the same even for reading documents, where we created a queue of requests for some items that are like take a little bit more like a few milliseconds. And the performance impact was huge. Like we went from having some documents that because of the, the jump that we had to go to fetch that data from the third party service, plus the persistence and all of that, we were running at the 400 milliseconds. After implementing this queuing mechanism, because we were like avoiding a lot of trips on the server, we were able to reduce it to as low as, low as three milliseconds. So it was something quite impressive. I think this is personally one of my favorite advices that you should be following when using not just databases in general, but every time that you have to make an, an IO to another system, you should be considering to use queues of requests in Node. And it's rather simple. Like this snippet that I, I'm attaching in the slides is fully operational. You don't need more code to run that. Very simple and very powerful. Advice number five, do not use primary key in production. That's kind of one of the number one pitfalls for people that are newcomers to Couchbase. I was one of them. Uh, very often, like we just drop it because we want to run off sort of, of, sorts of queries, but then it ends up like hurting really, really bad. Uh, can you clarify, do you mean the primary key for key value access or do you mean the primary index specifically? So the primary index is what we don't need to use. Yes, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the primary index, the problem is like, once you add it, pretty much everything is sorted uh, arbitrarily. So whenever you perform a SQL statement where where condition, like really it has to do a full scan because you're not fetching anything by that index in particular. So it allows you for development to kind of discover the kind of queries that you want to perform. But once in production, it's just gonna really hurt you bad, especially because it's gonna work for any query that you throw at it, but it's just gonna consume so much resources that you just better make sure that it's not even there. Good clarification, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And speaking of indexes, um, I just wanna say like it's all about the data sets and I think indexes by itself, it's its own topic and I want to cover some of the points. Um, this is the basic formula that we all use or we should be using is select and adding each one of the fields that we truly need. Very often I see people doing select start like just because they want to, not because um, there is no thought process about like if we truly need all the fields, like they just go for it and then I want you to pay attention to this part of the work clause. Like we always have to depart from the smaller subset of data. And this is gonna be highly important. I'm gonna show you the numbers why I'm, I'm doing this distinction. And I wish that someone told me that in the beginning because that was the root cause of my problem, the, the one that I showed before. And then if you have to do secondary conditions then they can follow up after that but you have to start always from the smaller subset. Um, this is what Nicole does under the hood. It executes a query plan where it first evaluates the query, then it fetches all the indexed fields matching the first criteria in the index, which means that whatever you set as your first condition is the data that is gonna come first in the query plan. Then it's gonna fetch the documents that like match the second criteria, apply all other filters, and deliver the result. 
So in my case, uh, it's a fictional case where we are trying to fetch the data, the programming guide data of, of AT&T DirecTV. We have a universe where we want to ask the query to retrieve all the documents from certain time of the day, from today at noon, at, um, then to 2 p.m. from channel one to three or whatever. So for queries, like the first thing that I always consider is if I really, if there is no way for me to use a key value per API instead, like I always prefer to do that. And then also like always make sure that you page your results, like don't send just a, a select whatever without like trying to page if you're gonna fetch multiple documents. Set a timeout for your request, like that's something that we missed early in the project. And it also like had a big effect for us. Like there were a lot of resources being queued. Um, when you have large data sets, uh, try to stream it as much as possible. All platforms, Node.js, Java, uh, Go, they all have really nice solutions to do that. And use the right, consistent, the right consistency level depending on the type of query that you're uh, fetching. Some people try to like just pick one because it's the fastest, but they don't think in consistency or the other way around. They want everything to be consistent even though it doesn't really matter and they will benefit from using the fastest option. Everything is really nicely documented on the website, Couchbase website and always load test and profile your, your queries. So as I was saying, like always try to avoid select the star. It really hurts the performance. It doesn't take advantage of something called covering indexes, which is kind of like one of the best secrets of Couchbase, like using covering indexes, which is gonna be like all these sections, like that can make all the difference in the world. Um, oops, I thought this was gonna be visible. Let me see if I can increase the font. Okay, so I think this is gonna be better. So as you can see, we can start by creating an index, right? And that's something that you shouldn't take that lightly. Like you have to think about what's the kind of data and how you wanna fetch it. But just for the sake of the example, because that's how we did it, we just created an index thinking of the field that we wanted and we didn't think of the order. And we are gonna run three different queries. The first one is what we usually write as select the start with the conditions that we discussed before. The second one is gonna be reducing the payload, just simply reducing the payload, picking some of the attributes that we need from that document, trying to reduce the size of the, the total payload over the network. And finally, we're gonna use covering indexes. Uh, covering indexes, I'm gonna discuss what they are later in another slide, but just keep an, keep an eye that this is a different one. When I run these three queries, like you can see a huge difference already. The, these, the orange and the red one are the simple query and the one with the reduced payload, meaning the select the start and the one that have reduced payload. There is almost no difference. But if you take a look at the covering index, just by using that particular piece, I was able to reduce to like, it's just a third of the time that the other one will take. So that was our first optimization that we did. And as you can see, it was already significant enough. Um, then covering index means that you are gonna index all of the fields that really you're fetching. Like so if you remember the example I had, select the start end and channel ID, three of these attributes, they were part of the original index. So basically what you're doing as part of the query cycle, like you're avoiding Couchbase to fetch to re-evaluate indexing, like it has everything in memory to do the indexing selection so that you can optimize and it doesn't have to scan the actual document but rather just fetch directly by the IDs that it has on the index. Um, let me go to another example. So after we did that, like we were wondering if we could do better, we dropped that index and we create an index where the first criteria, instead of being the starting time of the event, we flip it to be the channel ID. And after testing, you can see, if you remember, my best scenario was like a, a thousand milliseconds, which was like a second, and here right, I was able to reduce it to up to 130 milliseconds. Um, by the way, this is with 50 concurrent users on a single machine, so it was pretty impressive. If you compare the results, you can see like here at the bottom, this is where my cover index was working and everything else was my best cases for the other index. And what that means is that size matters, right? As I said before, 
if you grab first the data that you have in the first index, the ones with less data, that's gonna be enough to do the trick. That's everything that we did. That's why it worked. However, conditions can change. You can have a different query for the same data where the, the first index will be more effective. And for that, Couchbase gives us the possibility to use either one of the indexes. Like we can really create both indexes and select programmatically which one of them to use by just implementing this use index statement as part of the query. So that you can cover both use cases if you wanted in your application of having the two indices and just deciding which one to use. Um, just very quickly, this is what you have to look for in your query plan. Couchbase gives you that feature, so whenever you use it, this is the key part. Like when you execute the query plan, make sure that you have these covered parts and highlighted in your query plan. Other ones means that you're just using indexes, but you're not taking advantage of the full potential. And I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Fidencio. It's an excellent a body of excellent advice. Um, <laughs> Thank you. One of the reasons why these optimizations work, you know, Couchbase is a distributed system. And so we have separated the concerns and nickel between the query processor, the indexer, and the actual data store. And at query time, we have to move data across network links, which increases latency and makes it a much more unforgiving for things that are not optimized. So these optimizations that he's talking about are essential. Uh, to, to getting a, uh, a good experience. You know, the, the primary index, don't use that because <laughs> you're forklifting the whole bucket over for every query. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it's fun to play with, but, you know, not much more than that. Covering indexes are essential because that eliminates the fetch so you don't go to the key value store at all for query resolution. And then um, the uh, attribute ordering in the index, you know, high cardinality first, in order to, again, reduce the number of records you're pulling out of the index that the query processor has to filter through in order to resolve the query. So uh, a bunch of really great advice there. Um, any other questions for Videncio? No? Thank you. Thank you.